this is lecture six of ECE 5312, all right? So, so okay, so we talked a lot about AWGN. We talked about um, band-limited channels. Before that, we talked about source coding and channel coding and Shannon capacity and Shannon's uh, uh, channel coding theorem and, and such. So, okay, so we covered a lot of background material. We're going to revisit the AWGN channel a little bit later. We're going to revisit band-limited channels a little bit later after that. But what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about this thing called modulation. So it's almost like I'm building up to, you know, like sort of the moment of excitement, which is modulation. And now we're here. Ah! All right? So what, what basically modulation is, is a method of trying to map ones and zeros into something that can be communicated over the air. And you might say, OK. How? So, so let's, let's do the following. So it's, it's maybe a good idea to actually project this. So when you think of sending something over here, what, like, okay, or in any sort of medium, what, what, are, we, what are we transmitting? What, what thing, like, you know, electromagnetic energy, how is that communicated? Usually in waves, right? Well, it depends. If you ask physicists, they'll say particles or waves, right? And I don't want to get into that debate. How many people are physicists here? Physicists? OK, so we can make physics jokes now. Of course, this is being recorded, and eventually we'll go on YouTube. So soon I'm going to have my tires slashed and say, who's laughing now? Uh, sign, a physicist, no. But what happens is, um, really, when we talk about electromagnetic energy being propagated, we usually talk about waves, right? Light is traveling in waves of certain frequencies, different color light, different frequencies, but same waves, right? And uh, electromagnetic energy, wireless signals, for the most part, I like to think of them transmitting in waves. So when we're trying to transmit digital information, what are we trying to do? We're basically trying, like, so what we have, here's the, here's the dilemma. So I have, let's say, a wireless signal. That's a universal signal, uh, symbol for an antenna. You have a transmitter. Boop. You have a receiver, right? And then, boop, right, going right across from uh, the transmitter to the receiver. Now, what happens is that's great. I can send transmitters, and I can send, uh, I can send from the transmitter a sinusoidal, a sinusoidal signal, like some sort of electromagnetic wave. It's picked up by the receiver. So what? What type of, how do we embed my information into that? And the answer is as follows. So let's take the eraser. So let's redo this. So suppose that. We do the following. So I take, let's say this is my time axis, t. Let's break up my time axis such that every t seconds, there's a bunch of bits that are being represented by that sinusoidal waveform. OK? Let's draw that. 0, t, 2t, 3t, 4t. And it goes on. And what I do is. I, what I do during each one of those t seconds is I manipulate the waveform such that the receiver says, aha, gotcha, you're saying this. So what, remember, receivers are not like humans. We don't have, well, not yet, right, until they take over the world. What happens is they don't have, like, you know, receivers can be complicated, but for the most part, their functionality, like, you know, a human being would say, oh, I can see that, I see that information, I see that pattern. It has to be pretty clear for a receiver to say, oh, I see what you're sending, thanks for it. So, 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 the, so the question is, how can I manipulate, how can I craft my sine wave, my cosine wave, to contain information that uniquely identifies a certain binary pattern? And the answer is, what are usually the three things that I play with? Phase. Frequency, amplitude. Excellent. And there are many others, too. There's polarization, perhaps, and uh, maybe use coding schemes, and a variety of others. But for the most part, it's amplitude, frequency, phase. So given those, like for instance, if I want to play around with, like let's say I want to play with phase. And phase is fun, because phase is not so intuitive. OK, let's, let's use amplitude, because uh, phase is a little too tricky. So what happens is amplitude. 
So suppose I'm transmitting two bits per time period t. So let's say it's 10, 11, 00, 10. So during the first time period, let's say I have, and it should have been a full period, but I messed up. Then the next one might look like, and it doesn't really matter about the phase and stuff because the like frequency, I don't care. That doesn't contain any useful information. Phase, no, not either. But, but notice the amplitude. It's that high as opposed to this guy, which is this much lower. Let's say this guy here, the 0, 0, 0 is actually right, much higher. Oh. And then 1, 0, we go back to the amplitude before. So, so what ends up happening is A1 represents 1, 0. A2 represents 1, 1. A3 represents 0, 0. And A1, again, represents 1, 0. So this is how we you know, in a very rudimentary fashion, translate binary patterns into electromagnetic waveform characteristics. Every t seconds it changes to something else that uniquely identifies what the I'm trying to transmit over the air. Phase, what I would do is I have constant amplitude, constant frequency, but this waveform is 0 degrees out of phase. Now it's 90 degrees out of phase. Now it's 270 degrees out of phase. Now it's 180 degrees out of phase. Every phase difference represents a specific binary pattern. The receiver, it better be equipped with something to discriminate between different types of phases. This receiver will have to discriminate between different amplitude levels, right? And then frequency. Let's say I have that's transmitting at this frequency in this time period. And then the next one, it's really fast, so it represents another binary pattern. And then it's really slow, it represents yet another one. Each one of those frequencies in that time period T represents a specific binary pattern. And what's even better is that we can combine these things. Imagine, like, you know, through in all this madness, that different phase, different frequency, different amplitude, all at the same time. Oh, maybe polarization too, and a few other different combinations. The only thing is, the more sort of degrees of freedom that you introduce, the more complicated your receiver is going to be, right? You're going to have to detect phase and amplitude and frequency and different, all these differences in order to decipher. And then some channels are better than others. Let's say you're in a channel that distorts amplitude but does not distort phase. What type of modulation scheme will you use? Something that transmits in phase, right? Forget the amplitude. It's going to be corrupted anyway. Similarly, let's say something that does a lot of phase rotations and distorts the phase like crazy, but is your amplitude is nice and safe. You choose amplitude as the unique characteristic of your waveform. So the beauty of modulation is that you, all of you, and you, if, you, if you have a chance, do take my software-defined radio course because you actually will get to play with these electromagnetic waveforms over the air. What you do is you actually manipulate the waveforms, the phases, the amplitudes, the frequencies to communicate that information wirelessly or down the copper or the fiber or whatnot, right? Beautiful. All right. So what we're going to look at is two different types of modulation schemes. The first one is called binary pulse amplitude modulation. So it's a, there's a family called PAM, pulse amplitude modulation. All it really is, this is an amplitude modulation. If I receive at the receiver, if I intercept a signal at the receiver, a signal with this amplitude, I know, ah, it's this binary pattern. I now receive some signal with this amplitude level, that binary pattern, and so on. All the information is embedded in the amplitude that is received. When I talk about binary PAM, what happens is I only have two amplitudes to choose from. Ah? Huh? One, ah, uh, zero, right? So the modulation rule is have a waveform. Zero, one is mapped to S1 of T. Zero is mapped to S2 of T. And it turns out because it's binary, the symbol duration is equal to the bit duration, right? One bit is represented during T. So it makes sense that the rate at which you're getting those bits at the transmitter and translating them into symbols, that bit 
the bit duration is equal to the symbol duration. Otherwise, you're going to have a backlog of bits, and you don't know what to do with that, right? And it's also bad if, let's say, like, let's say you, you get these bits, and you transcend, like, you know, as soon as you get it, you send all the symbols, the symbol in any way, like, let's say you have a lot of space in between each symbol, because as soon as you get the bit, you just fire it away until the next bit comes. So you don't actually use the whole duration. That's also not so good, because the sudden changes between here's a symbol, and then it's a zero, and then a symbol, what you're doing is actually those sharp transitions increases the bandwidth utilization. Right? Sharp transitions are bad in wireless communication. So let's suppose our pulse looks like this very tame looking rectangular pulse, right? From zero to t, it has a certain amplitude a, right? Plus a, it's a one. Minus a, it's a zero, right? So if I send over the air, If I send over the air something that looks like this, nope. And so I would say that's a one, zero, one, one, zero, right? Because one maps to S1 of T, which happens to look like this over t. So this is 0, t, 2t, 3t, uh, 3t, 4t, right? And then that's 5t. And a binary 0 is mapped to s2 of t, which is, and that's a. Oops. Eraser tool. <laughs> So that's my rule for mapping ones and zeros. Cool, huh? Now the question is, um, we ha so we have this modulation scheme, and the main question that we have is, how much energy is being expended per bit? Right? So remember, rule number one of this course is that the fundamental unit of information is the bit. Not the packet, not the frame, not the atom, it's a bit. Bits are our friends. Love bits. So the metric for how energy efficient our modulation scheme is, how much energy are we expending per bit? And let's, let's keep it simple. Let's say it's the amount of energy expended in creating the waveform that we send over the air. There's probably a whole bunch of other energy that we're not accounting for, right? Like the radio doing all the processing, and it's connected to the power supply, and all that jazz, right? as well as maybe all the energy you're expending trying to code the thing, right? Like, energy is a very loose definition. The number of sleepless nights that you spend and, you know, the heating that you use to heat the room in order for you to code the radio that you're going to put on the software-defined radio to send the waveform over. So there are different metrics for energy. But let's say we just keep it simple. The amount of energy expended by transmitting over the air that bit in the waveform itself. And the way you calculate the average bit energy there's a law of math, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, and it's called Euclidean distance. So I'm going to bring up, I'm going to derive on the board what these two guys are, right? Okay, so how do you calculate bit energy? Bit energy. Okay. And so what you do is the following. So to calculate energy of a symbol, ES, let's say it's ES1 for symbol 1. You would take the integral from 0 to t of S1 of t squared dt, right? So energy has a squared relationship regarding, with respect to amplitude. You would take the symbol waveform, you would square it, and you would integrate it over the period, and that will give you the energy, right? And so, and then the same thing you would do for ES2. You'd be this guy. Now, uh, since we're dealing with a binary waveform here, so, so for instance, let's look at the case of BPAM. So for BPAM, 
we would have the following. So E S1 integrate from 0 to t. And then what we would have is A, right, U of t. That's my unit step function minus unit step function minus t. All that squared dt. Now, the thing is, that's redundant, right? Because it's, we're integrating from 0 to t, which is the flat portion of that waveform. The square of that flat portion of that waveform, which is amplitude 1, is 1. So we can safely rewrite this as a squared dt. We can take the a out because it's a constant. And what we're left with is this, a squared t. So that is the energy for symbol 1. Symbol 2, the exact same thing. Like you do the math, OK? So exercise for the student. Show that es2 is also equal to a squared t. Now, um, what I would want to do is what is the average energy per uh, what, is the a what is the average symbol energy? Well, what I would do is the following. I would take my, um, so this is, this is a little bit where probability comes in. So to get the average, and usually we represent average as a bar, it would be the probability that we get a 1 times the energy of, of the, 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 the symbol S1 plus the probability of getting a 0 times the energy of the zero symbol, which is ES2. And so if they're equally probable, usually if people say, oh yeah, uh, ones and zeros are equally likely to occur, that's 50-50. This probability here is 0.5, and that one's 0.5. And so we also know that this guy here is A squared T, and that guy there is A squared T. So what do we get? We get A squared T. Now, to get the average bit energy, mm, let's erase that. So if you want the average bit energy, what you would want to do is the following. Um, EB bar. Because the reason is, why do people care about average bit energy instead of average symbol energy? Because what happens is, let's say you take two modulation schemes, and you calculate their average symbol energies. But one modulation scheme maps four bits to the symbol, and one maps six bits to the symbol. It's not a fair comparison, right? Remember, fundamental unit, the bit, OK? So the bit is our friend. So we take the average symbol energy, and we divide it by the number of bits that are represented per symbol. In this case, b is equal to 1. So it turns out that this guy is equal to a squared t. So that's, that's how you calculate the average bit energy for, in this case, BPAM. Likewise, if suppose you want to do um, uh, the, the Euclidean distance. So what, what is Euclidean distance? Sounds cool, huh? So suppose, like, you know, Friday night, you want to impress some friends, say, oh, yeah, I learned Euclidean distance uh, in class just the other night. And everyone say, oh, that sounds so cool. Tell me more. What the Euclidean distance is, essentially, how different are two waveforms from each other? So what is, what is the definition? Euclidean distance, so d min squared. So I chose the generic waveforms, si of t and sj of t. So Euclidean distance is equal to the integral 0 to t of si of t minus sj of t, all of that squared, and dt. What, what, am I, what am I saying here? Basically, let's find out how different these two waveforms are. What's the difference between the two of them? And then let's find the energy of that difference, right? What, what, what's desirable? What's desirable about Euclidean distance? The larger Euclidean distance, the better it is, because that means we have more difference energy between symbol i and symbol j, which means that in the real world, if we transmit one or the other, my receiver will be better to discriminate which one has been transmitted.
right? So bigger Euclidean distances are better, just like Hamming distances. We want to be, we want to differentiate. Now, in this case, like, you know, so, so really the Euclidean distance is we're trying to find what is the energy of the difference between the two symbols. So if we take now our representation as before, and let's, let's forget about the unit step functions because we're, we're obviously operating over from zero to t. So what we have is we essentially have an A, you know, PT, right? And then we have minus, minus A, PT, all that squared. That becomes a plus. So what we end up getting is 4 A squared. The PT doesn't matter because it's over the limits of integration. It's flat, DT. How do I get that? What happens is this guy here now becomes a plus a, 2a, when we sum them together, squared, 4a squared. That should be equal to 4a squared t, because we take this guy out, and we're just basically integrating over a constant 1, right? Now, we have our Euclidean distance. The metric that we're going to come up with, and so I'm going to switch gears, the metric that we're going to come up with is something called the power efficiency, or epsilon p. Power efficiency basically says, here's your Euclidean distance. And it's, as I said, it's favorable to have a very large Euclidean distance. Means that the signals are as different from each other as possible. But if you had to expend a lot of, a lot of energy to make them look different, it's going to come out in the wash. What's going to happen is, you have, here's your Euclidean distance divided by your average bit energy. If, let's say, the amount of energy that you had to invest in making that Euclidean distance so large is large in itself, the ratio actually will be rather pitiful, right? On the other hand, it will turn out, if we evaluate for BPAM, what is the Euclidean, what is And so I do all this math. So it's written on the slides here. So if I take, let's say, the signal waveforms, and we compute the d min, which is 4a squared t, as written here, and we compute what the average bit energy is, which is a squared t, and we take the ratio, it's 4. What's beautiful about 4? It turns out that binary PAM is the most power efficient modulation scheme that you'll be dealing with. There are some caveats. It's the most power efficient modulation scheme that you can use if you use every possible symbol representation available to you. So what I mean to say is, suppose you have two bits represent one symbol. So that means you can use up to a maximum of four different waveforms to represent those two bits uniquely, right? There are some modulation schemes that say, let's suppose you only have three two-bit patterns that we actually transmit over the air and forget about the last one. You'll actually get power efficiency values that will be like six or seven. But that, that's, it's inefficient for other ways, right? So let's suppose if you have B bits and you have, and you have a total number of representation equal to two to the B, the best possible power efficiency that you can get is BPAM is 1. We'll see BPSK is exactly the same at 4. And then the miracle of it all, which is next lecture, QPSK, quadrature phase shift skiing, is also 4. And then it goes downhill from there. And we'll look at that trend in the next lecture. But for now, yes? So, so I'm sorry? Oh. So, okay, so the question is, so, okay, thank you. So what is the PT? So the PT is the shape of the pulse. So that's the unit step function. So, so for instance, PT here, oh, let's, let me use a different color. PT here and here essentially represents 0 to T. And that could be unit step, right? 
So this guy here, so S, let's say it's S1 of T, and that represents a 1. That is A, 0 to T. And S2 of T, which represents 0, is, sorry, yep, m uh, minus A from 0 to T. So basically, every symbol period is either plus amplitude or minus amplitude. Good question. Good question. Yep. Mm. Ah, yes. So, good question. So, the question is on slide 3. So, P1 is the probability that I transmitted a 1. P0 is the probability I transmitted a 0. Excellent question. Because, what, and in this case, we make the assumption that the two are equiprobable. All right? Excellent question. And even if they weren't, it turns out that what they are multiplied with are identical. This is equal to a squared t. So it doesn't really matter if the equiprobable or not. The power is the same. It's only in the case if, if you, let's say, s1 is a waveform and s2 is 0, ah, then the energy expended is actually different. Okay? Excellent point. All right. And in fact, that is the EFT exercise for a student. Oh, how psychic. Turn out that the power efficiency of this BPAM representation is actually not so good. Okay. I, th I, th I think I'm actually really curious. Let's find out. That and also I want to play with the screen thing here. <laughs> I know what I want for Christmas next year. Okay. So let, let's actually, let's, let's start from, from the top. So S1 of T looks like this. S2 of T. So let's say that, that is my 1. And S2 of t, which is my 0, looks like this, right? So first thing is, what are my average symbol energies? So this guy, like what we saw before, ES1 is going to be equal to a squared t, right? This guy, 0. So what is the average symbol energy? So it's going to be the probability of 1, ES1, plus the probability of 0, ES2. So this guy goes to 0. Let's say the equiprobable in this case, a squared t over 2. Now, let's do Euclidean distance. Because so we have, we're using on, oh, OK. So, oh, forgot something. Ah. And the thing is, what is the average bit energy? One bit per symbol. It should be the same thing, right? Now, if we do the Euclidean distance, okay, and we do S1 minus S2, all that squared, dt, turns out that the second guy is 0, right? So it becomes S1 squared T. Oh, look, it's, it's equal to ES1. And that's going to be equal to A squared T, right? So what is the, you, 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 the, what is the power efficiency? So let me, where's my eraser bit? So my power efficiency, epsilon P, for this scheme, will be d min squared over e b bar. So d min squared is equal to a squared t. And uh, e b bar is equal to a squared t over 2. We have a 3 dB loss in power efficiency. This is actually bad news. So we might say, whoa, 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 whoa. But I'm not using any power for a second symbol. It's quite distinct, right? Yeah, but think about it. When you had a signal that had an amplitude of A every period and a symbol that had an amplitude of minus A, they were pretty far apart from each other, right? Now, let's make one of the symbols 0. Need a little bit less noise, actually, to differentiate. If you notice, I'm coming closer to the other waveform. 
And in fact, if I add noise, I don't need to add as much noise in order to make this guy potentially look like that guy or vice versa, as opposed to when they're like literally a and minus a. And so my Euclidean distance shrinks because I'm actually not investing as much energy into separating those two waveforms from each other. <laughs> not good. Right. Yeah. Three dB. Three dB. Uh, oh no! I'm, 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 so, so the question is: Is the power, if, uh, the measure of power efficiency in dB, uh, not quite? That's a, it's a good point. I just say because I'm, I'm just saying it's a 50 percent loss. So it's, yeah, I'm trying to sound uh, sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. No. It's the Canadian English. Um, so what, what in reality, there's something called uh, SNR loss. Okay, so it's called, a, it's a little del delta SNR. And what the SNR loss is, because remember what dB means. dB is always a ratio. It's unitless. So what we do, so what's the best possible power efficiency that we can have? Four. So what we do is we usually take the ratio of the best possible power efficiency divided by the power efficiency that we actually get, take 10 log 10 of that, that will give us our SNR loss in dB. All right? Good, good point. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's almost the same thing like, you know, when you, in language, right? When you talk to people and you say order of magnitude. When I say order of magnitude, everybody here should say, oh, yeah, base 10, right? So order of magnitude should be 10 times more or 10 times or one-tenth as much as what I'm referring to, right, as a reference. But if you go to someone in arts and humanities and you say, oh, it's an order of magnitude worse or something, they'll think, the, the, to them, they, think of, they don't think in terms of base 10 in arts and humanities. So I found out, I was talking with a history professor and said, this is an order of magnitude bigger. And they say, oh, it's that large. And I said, like, how large is it really? I said, it's 10 times larger. Oh, really? Okay. Like, you know, lingua franca. Lingua franca. All right. Language and communications. So, congratulations, folks. We just moved on to our next modulation scheme. Ha, ha, ha. So what happens is we looked at, so we manipulated amplitude in order to convey information. Now we're going to manipulate the phase. So you might say, how do I do that exactly? Well, the modulation rule here that we're going to use is it's one. Like, let's say this uh, S1 of t is essentially a cosine with a particular phase and a particular frequency. Frequency is kept fixed. Amplitude is kept fixed. But the phase is theta. And S2 is also cosine, but let's say it's out of phase by pi. It's 180 degrees out of phase. Basically, the inverse is 1, right? Although binary phase shift keying modulation schemes don't necessarily have to be 180 degrees out of phase, although if you do the power efficiency calculation, it gives you the best result. What ends up happening, how does this look like? So let's say we, 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 we go into like an IQ. Like let's say we go into an imaginary real plane and we modulate, we, we look at the points that are represented by S1 and S2. Let's say totally in, a, in sort of this environment. What happens is when they're pi degrees out of phase, they're polar opposites, right? What happens if they're 90 degrees out of phase? They're a little bit closer, right? We'll look at this later in the course when we translate all these waveforms into vector space, represent, signal vector representation. But when we have a signal when it's 180 degrees out of phase, we refer to it as antipodal, right? Total opposite. And it turns out that its power efficiency is also equal to 4. So let's, let's do that on the board as well. Okay, so we know that 1 is represented by what? S1 of t, A cosine omega ct plus theta, and 0, S2 of t is equal to A cosine omega ct plus theta plus pi. Ooh, scary stuff. So we go through the same sort of processes as before. So in fact, it's, there are three steps. One, find d min squared. Two, find eb bar. Three,
calculate power efficiency, right? Simple. So d min squared, so we apply the definition, s1 of t minus s2 of t squared dt. Now things are going to get messy, messy. So if I give you a quiz question next week that involves this, I will probably give you a trig table along with it. Because what happens is, let's say I replace this, cos omega ct plus theta plus a cos omega ct plus theta plus pi, all that squared. If you work this out, what you're going to get is the following. So what you're going to get is you're going to get an a squared cos squared omega ct plus theta term. You're going to get an a squared cos squared omega ct plus theta plus pi term. And you're going to get, what is it? I think it's uh, 2 a squared cos omega ct plus theta cos omega ct plus theta plus pi. Wow, that's not going to be fun. So right away, what you can do is several things. One trig identity that you should be very familiar with is this guy is equal to half plus half cosine 2 omega ct plus 2 theta. And this is going to be half plus half cos 2 omega ct plus 2 theta plus pi. Uh, sorry, 2 pi. Now what happens is this is all being integrated. So I'm going to use a, a different color. This is all being integrated from 0 to Ah, there we go. 0 to t and then dt, right? All of this. But it turns out that right away, I can, I'm going to use the pink, I can throw this away and that away. And you might say, OK, w w what are you doing, prof? So cos 2 pi omega ct blah, 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 blah. This is what we refer to as a double frequency term. So double frequency term means that we go when we do this identity, now we're integrating over a period of something that's periodic. When we now go double frequency terms This is a little trick that we pull off. What we do is 2 omega the DC term, the half, here and here. That guy there, this trig identity, that I don't really want to touch. <laughs> well, what happens is this guy here, it's a cos A, cos B scenario. So you would do the same thing. There would be a bunch of double frequency terms and a DC term. Get rid of that, and you'll have that at the end. All right? So this is, like, I won't go through the rest of it because, again, mostly just trig. But what you would do is essentially go through all these steps. A, what you should get is some sort of constant or something that, uh, quite nice, which we'll, we'll, I'll show on the slides when we get back. But let's do also, like, the, en the, the calculation of the energy is actually exactly the same thing. So let's actually go back to the paper. So. do to step one and calculate the demon, what it turns out, okay, so we do this, this difference. And in this case, it's actually, um, you know, we, we can actually, I, I didn't have to do it the complicated way. I could have done it very easily. Um, darn. But what ends up happening is it turns out when we do the calculation, you see that we have the double frequency term there disappears. And what we're left with is 2a squared t. Beautiful. And then let's compute the average bit energy. So you compute the average symbol energy by finding out the individual symbol energies for S1 of t and S2 of t. You'll find that they're equal to a t squared, uh, sorry, a squared t over 2. And then if we assume equally probable, the average bit energy, which is equal to the average energy, is a squared t over 2. Right? So if you take the ratio, you get 4. Hey, All right? 
But the one thing I really wanted to point out, and that's why I did it on the, the whiteboard here, is the fact of the double frequency term. This is something, I remember when I took this course, when did I take this course? I took this course in 1999, and I had no clue what this double frequency term thing is. Like, it came up everywhere. I'm like, why are you doing that, professor? Right? And it turns out now it makes total sense. Peaks and valleys of the sinusoid basically cancel out. Beautiful. And using that trick, that shortcut, you save a lot of pain and heartache afterwards in terms of solving for what the average bit energy is or the D-min. It's almost like, I'm not sure how many people here have taken like an advanced course in microelectronics. If you had like 26 transistors all connected together and you had to find the current in one little branch, there's something called the beta plus one rule, right? And uh, if you forget it, like I did during my uh, midterm for that course many, many decades ago, it will take a long while to solve for that little current in that 26 transistor. So don't forget about the frequency term trick, okay? All right. Now, um, okay. What we're going to show later on is that, in fact, this, these, these terms that I'm coming up with, these um, power efficiencies and stuff, can actually be used to calculate the probability of error. Not directly, but, um, but it, it will be used uh, in, in, the, in the calculation later on. In fact, what happens is if you have, let's say, non-equiprobable bits and such occurring, you'd use actually d min squared. You'd use Euclidean distance rather than the actual bit energy, right? So there is another way, just, just to make this course all the more fun of finding out what the d min squared is. And it has sort of a vector uh, linear algebra type of flavor to it. What turns out is, let's say we take S1 and S2. This is a 2. It's just that the photocopy of it didn't come out so well. If you take the difference between two, those two waveforms and expand it, what you're going to get is S1 squared plus S2 squared um, minus 2S1, uh, sorry, minus 2 S1t, S2t, multiply together, and integrate from 0 to t. Now, this is very interesting. So let's, let's think linear algebra for a little bit. So we know that S1t squared integrate from 0 to t gives me the energy of S1t, right? Same thing. If we integrate from 0 to t of S2t squared, that gives me the energy of S2t, right? What about the integral of the product? of S1 and S2. What is that? It turns out, OK, waveforms, just the product of two waveforms, right? Linear algebra, it's actually the projection of the waveform S1 of t onto S2 of t. It's actually the dot product. You might not see it right away. When we convert all of this into signal vector space, it's, it's basically this will degenerate into S1, the vector, dot S1, the vector, gives you the energy of S1. S2, the vector, dot S2, the vector, gives you the energy of S2. And S1, the vector, dot S2, the vector, gives you this. What do dot products do? They project one vector onto the other. So what, what in another way, what, what, what do we call when we, in the, in, especially in probability world, when we project one thing onto another, how much is one thing contained in another? It's a correlation. Another way of referring to that integral is it gives us a correlation coefficient. It tells us how much information, how correlated is one waveform, how similar is one waveform, how much information of one, one waveform is contained in the other one. Beautiful, right? <laughs> so what happens is, um, bottom line, is we can rewrite this all where if you're, like, let's say, instead of calculating d min first and then the energies, calculate your individual energies first, and then when you do the d min calculation, all you need to do is calculate this pesky little correlation coefficient expression, and you got your answer, rather than having to do all that trig math again, which nobody likes trig math, right? I still don't know what cos a cos b is equal to. So, um, given that new construct, you can still get essentially um, the bottom line, which is that the minimum, uh, the power efficiency is equal to four, 
And let's say you had some flexibility. Okay. So let's say, um, um, like, if, if let's say what we wa ultimately want to do is keep e epsilon p as large as possible. That's a good thing. We want to keep the power efficiency to be very power efficient. What ends up happening is, um, let's say, in, especially in the PSK, we choose a phase separation that's not 180 degrees. It's not pi. What happens is our power efficiency will obviously go down. Right? And there are a few examples that we can work out, but I think I'm going to leave those to the class. Okay? So just before we conclude today's lecture, what are some of those examples? So, so first of all, so let's say we graphically represent this BPSK equation. So in the vector space, which we'll look at a few lectures from now, we can represent, let's say, S1 of t as a vector S1 in space. We can represent the vector S2, um, uh, uh, S, uh, the, the, sorry, the waveform S2 of t as the vector S2 in space. Um, and then there are certain distance away from the origin. That will actually dictate how much energy is contained in each one of those signals. And then their relative separation in terms of phase plus how much they're phase separated by, right? And so that's our vector diagram. And that, the, the, later on, we'll see how that translates into a signal constellation diagram. And what you'll see is how much of S1 projects onto S2? Nothing. When they're perfectly orthogonal like that, that's a really, really nice situation, right? There's absolutely no common information between. So a few examples. Just like what we saw before, suppose we have S1 that is a cosine modulated signal, and then we have 0. What we'll find is, again, there's a 50% decrease in the power efficiency, and that's due to the fact that even though we're using less energy, the amount of separation, distinction between one waveform and another is also decreased, actually, unfortunately, more than, let's say, the amount of energy savings we have. And so that's why we have a power efficiency of 2. So Everyone should try that out at home. And then the other beautiful one is what happens when you have a cosine and a sine modulated uh, waveforms? So what is the phase difference between sine and cosine? 90, right? 90 degrees. So what you'll find is that that too. What happens? So how would the vector diagram look like? Right? 90 degrees. And you know we're talking about like you know um, Euclidean distance. What's Euclidean distance? Well, graphically, if you look at the signal diagram, my fingers, if you draw a hypotenuse between the two points, is closer than if it's like this. So the Euclidean distance is actually smaller when it's like that. And we're still expending about the same amount of energy. So it's not going to be a great power efficiency. right? We don't get the most bang for our buck. So that's something that you should also try. And Bengi's question about you know, 3dB, well, no, no, 3dB is, again, like if you want to impress your friends and say, let's say, let's say um, you're only 50% of the way through shopping, let's, let's say for groceries, and you say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm only 3 dB of the way through, right? Great way of confusing your friends or them saying, you're, you're watching too much Big Bang Theory, right? Uh, but in reality, what you would do is there's something called SNR loss. And the, and the loss is basically you relate your power efficiency of BPSK or QPSK, which is the same, it's four, versus whatever other power efficiency in order to find out. And it's going to give you a positive number in dB. And that's the metric that we use to compare one against the other. All right. And so with that, um, that concludes lecture six. All right. Oh, good. So, um, so what I'm going to do is 